Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to Australian Arts Gallery. And we're happy for this uh, current exhibition, the September October Collective, which features the uh, work of Leslie Fenton, Caroline Furr, Susan Leshnoff, Kathleen McSherry, and Gus Sermis. So, what we're going to do is go through the uh, exhibitions and each artist will uh, speak about their work. And then at the end, we'll uh, take questions for everybody. So you can hold your questions to the end. You can either put them in the chat to me directly, or uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll go from there. Um, the exhibition is on through October 10th, and you can visit the gallery in person Wednesday through Friday 10 to 6 and Saturday and Sunday 12 to 6. Um, and you can also see all the work on our website um, as well. And uh, we are recording tonight's Zoom. So uh, we'll post it on our YouTube channel so you can watch it later or send it to, or to anybody who may have missed it. Yeah. And uh, you'd want to stay muted during the, the walkthrough because we pick up background noise. The artists, you'll uh, wanna unmute yourself as we, as we get to you. So we will start. <clears throat> Ready for takeoff? Get your seat belts fastened. And the first uh, artist we're going to visit is Leslie Fenton. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Michael. <laughs> so will you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, so I work in paper and I work in a way that I, a sort of technique I've developed on my own over the years. I found myself affixing paper to canvas when I used to paint on canvas. And after a while, I thought, why am I even bothering with the canvas? The paper was what was intriguing me because it is so malleable. It can be, uh, you can do so many things to it and you're not bound by that sort of gridded surface of the canvas. So um, from that point on, things opened up and the piece we're looking at right now that we just passed, Generators, was a piece from a few years ago um, a show that I had at Cerulean that was all black and white. Um, the works, um, I would say the imagery, it's, it's very much taken from, um, you know, natural forms, but I select uh, elements that I think are um, characteristic, let's say, of a place I've been or an experience I've had, I select those elements and then I sort of use them as the building blocks um, in a kind of abstract sense, building blocks and motifs or patterns for particular pieces. So the one we're looking at now I call Smolder. Um, I've moved from the black and white back to my very limited color palette, which is ultramarine, raw and burnt umber, white and black. Um, I like working within limitation because I, I sort of love pushing the texture rather than adding color. I feel that um, it's almost infinite what can be done. So within that limitation, I really, it's even sort of a metaphor for me, I guess. I, I like resourcefulness in life and I like it in art. Um, so I find that very exciting um, uh, to sort of think that way as I'm working and just keep expanding the vocabulary. Um, finding ways that um, almost pointillist dots can represent, not only do they represent things like pollen, spores, um, but they sort of represent, you know, energy, compression, the generation of new life. Um, and uh, this piece we're looking at right now, dry bed, I, um, I love the doubleness of a piece being both an object, um, very much an object with a coherent surface, but that is very tactile, um, and also uh, a pictorial image that reads as having, you know, pictorial space that you can go back into, as well as sort of reside or travel across 
surface of. Um, this piece I did in a residency I attended this past summer with my husband um, outside of Scranton. My husband's a playwright, Tom Gibbons, and we got a, uh, a residency in an old converted church. Um, I go outside at night and feel the presence in this farm country of you know, just insects, density, the richness of, of, of the farm country. Um, and I try to find graphic equivalents of those experiences to express in my pieces rather than um, their similitude to you know, the actual scene. It's more the energy, the feeling of being there. This piece to the left, um, stone blooms. I, I sort of like, I like this idea of um, something almost floral coming out of rock-like form. Um, I thought that was uh, something interesting to explore in that piece. This one I call seawall. Um, uh, yeah, very sort of, you know, fossilized forms. I, I was also exploring very much the idea of the suppressing light, I guess, the idea of suppressing it and having it leak out and pop out in different uh, places um, and to different degrees within the piece. These pieces are all very recent, um, again, so I'm sort of using many of the forms I had used in the black and white pieces, but um, bringing back the palette and sort of moving. Uh, I've been reading a lot about, you know, I read sort of physics for the lay person. I'm not a physicist, but the idea of dark matter, um, the idea of there being sort of another world parallel to the to the one that we may physically experience. Um, not that I necessarily believe there's actually, you know, a ghostly world, but I I sort of feel that. Um, uh, you know, we all experience the natural world as often something, you know, there's what's there, but we have a, we have a, a response to it um, that is internal. And I try to convey that in these pieces through inventing forms to express that. So this piece to the left was um, Dark Matter is the title. The one to the right, I, I became interested in this idea of sort of leaf cuts. Here we are, yeah, the dark matter, you sort of see, we're going back and forth between a world of color and, and sort of a world of almost a skeletal world that sort of runs parallel to, to that. It's, you could read all sorts of metaphors into that, but I, I just, um, I find that interesting going back and forth between black and white and the color, sort of Leslie, uh, how did you come to work with paper? Did, how did, did you start with this? I, when I, went to, I went to Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and studied painting for four years, and it was after I left the academy. I didn't work in paper this way at all while I was there. But um, I think I was mentioning I, I was working on canvas doing oil paintings, then doing acrylic, and then at one point I started just um, using, you know, the, um, the medium, the acrylic matte medium, and just sort of affixing the paper, and then I thought, well, so now I just use, I, I use cotton linter as my substrate. Well, that's cotton, not true. Uh, I use that for the smaller pieces. I actually use just arches, watercolors, the substrate for like this one. Um, and then I use cotton lincher, which paper makers beat up to into pulp to make paper, but I don't do that. I start with, this is all just with rolls of, and it's not even rolls, it's pieces of white paper that's very thick and absorbent. I peel it apart. I said, <laughs> it sort of looks like an English muffin, you know, you take the paper and sort of pull it apart and it exposes this very rough um, interior that you can use as a topography to press into, um, you know, ink or to press into acrylic paint of different um, viscosities to get different 
um, densities of paint and color. Yeah, I mean, you can't really, it doesn't read as that well on Zoom, but they have a very textural quality. They're extremely um, layered. And um, I do want to, I do want to thank Tina for a couple of things. One is she had suggested at some point when I had my black and white show that maybe people weren't realizing since the pieces were behind glass, how they were made. Um, in fact, one person thought they were prints, and when you get up close, you see the layering. It's extremely labor-intensive and um, takes a while for a piece to develop and ripen to the point where I feel it's finished. Um, and uh, so anyway, Tina had suggested, why not bring them out? They're almost like a leaf or sculpture in a way. <laughs> You could almost think of them as sculptures. So I did mount some of the ones in this show and in a previous show just on panels. Um, and I do think it, people do seem to um, appreciate more the relief quality of the pieces with that presentation. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. One is horrid, it's sort of you know, an insect form. Um, again, I'm sort of abstracting elements of insects and, and um, vegetation, plant life, and, and also light um, and featuring them, not necessarily representing an actual insect or an actual plant. They're elements that I've sort of re reconfigured. It's a beautiful body of work. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I, I, again, I, I just have to say, I, I always, I tell Tina that I'm always um, thrilled to walk in and see the way she's hung things. It's sort of like she makes sense out of them for me sometimes in the way she hangs the work. So, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we're going to move down the hall to uh, Kathleen McSherry's exhibition. Kathleen? Kathleen, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Wow. Uh, I just wanted to tap on something that Carolyn said is um, that Tina did a wonderful job um, putting this all together. She really made sense out of it. Um, I'm a found art sculptor and I, I've been collecting stuff forever at an auction I go to. And this piece number five is one of, one of the items I have gathered. I think I gathered it over the course of like four years and then I put it together that it seemed to hold it. And I've been doing it now for about 12 years. And um, I, I do a variety of artwork that goes on a podium or what I call war, uh, wall sculpture. Um, and um, they're, they're fun for me to do or they make a poignant message. But, um, and I, I take items that have lost their meaning, like the camera folds out. Nobody uses that anymore. Nobody uses a lot of stuff that you can find for very cheap at an auction. Um, and I put them together in a new and different way. So I kind of breathe new life in into the mind and, um, and and give them a whole new life, a new face, a new story, and uh, a, uh, a new piece. It, it, it breathes new life into it. This is called, um, hmm, what is this one called? Uh, 
I've forgotten that name. But at, at any rate, this this particular piece, and I often do that in my work, is that round piece is a cutting board. And I find cutting boards work really well um, with found ups, up art sculpture. They can, they're thick enough that you can uh, glue or hammer uh, stuff to it. And it, it, it really um, stands out when, when it's hung. Uh, let's see, we go into this. The two sculptures that are hanging, um, I, I'm using um, washboards. Um, this is um, a uh, kind of, um, this is a housewife getting, um, getting um, crucified. What? crucified by her lot in life. Um, and she's being uh, shot through the heart with a, with a, um, a, uh, clothespin. Thank you. Uh, and with a clothespin. And that was very poignant, but it, it's back in, at the time that I made it. And, and it's really come to life again. That's what's nice about having these pieces. They, they have a life. And the one next to it is called Problem Child. And I, I had the, this um, piece of a sculpture of a woman's head and then a baby coming through a hot water bottle. And by just saying it subtly, it's a problem child, it's bursting through um, a hot water bag. So it, it's forcing, um, forcing it, it, it's forcing the viewer to uh, pay attention to it. Um, and, and a lot of people find that a little off-putting, but, but I don't. Um, and this, this is my series of eight. Um, these are all heads that I made out of, um, out of various stages. One is, well, this is the black one over there is, has a safe on his head and, and duct tape over his mouth. And it's called, Can You Keep a Secret? And, and on the bottom of all these pieces, there's not only the, the shock of what these heads are, but if you look at the bottom of the stand, there's, this is all like a, an Algonquin headdress and it's got needles on it, but I, I, I make the, the top part with needles and buttons and there's, um, a bottom component to that too, and if you see those are are we it's it almost look like looks like a cross upside down, but those are really um, uh, those are really um, uh, printers printers pieces glued together, um, and and my friend there with can you keep a secret? He's sitting on a on a. Uh, a 78 record. So it's all, it's all pieces that are no longer used and I'm making you see them in a new and different way. Um, this one is, I found the head, headgear at a, um, uh, at a store that sold, um, that sold, uh, pieces of uh, things that, that um, were left on an airplane. And, uh, and this one here, there's a, a, that's a globe over there. And, and uh, this one here is using old floppy disks and probably the oldest cell phone I've ever seen before. And if you can see that head is kind of, um, uh, this uh, crumbling apart. They're all um, outdated um, in the past symbols of, of our world. Um, and this one too, it's a, it's a camera lens for the eye and um, it's called um, 
Union, Union League. And uh, it's got a headdress on it and teeth on it. And it's got rolls of film stuffed in the ears. And it, when you first look at it, it's kind of a setback. It, it's a brutal image um, that makes you look at it, then look back stand back and then look at it again that invites, invites you back in. Um, this one is with meters on it and, um, and let me just see that and and little hands call, going over the um, it's almost like a uh, what is that called like headset. A headset and there's a meter on top and that one eye is is smacked open and it's it can't quite close both eyes it's it's um unsure and it's untrusting so one eye is always open and then there's a meter down on the bottom of it um and this one is a, a this one made out of wood is um in my backyard and I found a, a bird's nest, which is in on the top of his head, and there's a little globe um, resting in it, waiting to mature and grow. And it's sitting on four pencils with a sharp point, and and all, and that's made out of wood. And then it, it's like his whole headdress. You're getting a slice of what inside and then all of the uh, the branches uh, around are kind of cradling his his neck and protecting him and then there's if you look down at the bottom there's um, there's more um, wood sticks um, on the bottom of it and it's making little nests on top of the three uh, posts. Um, and then this one, this one is a mask and, and with a headdress of pencils. Again, it's a symbol I used beforehand, but uh, it is, it looks angry and it, and the flames around the neck only um, heighten that anger. Um, and it's, it's getting an input from those pencils inside the head. And then there are broken pencils underneath. I have to thank um, uh, Tina for putting them in a semicircle. It works very well to uh, stand in front of the semicircle and see the work around. There's a power into all of that. Uh, Yeah, and, it, and you get the feeling that they're all different. They all make a different uh, statement, yet they are all together. Uh, and this one is Pomona's bounty. And we have Pomona there and she has, her bounty is the, the fruit around her. And there's a little bird and, and a banana and some cherries. And she looks like she's just shed a tear. She uh, is around it. She's comfortable in her in her little box, but there's a certain sadness in her look. And that top piece is an upside down um, shelf, and it kind of finishes it off. And this one is called Sure Shot. I got at an auction a bunch of those uh, little toy revolvers and they're half revolvers and they were all rusty. So I was uh, scraping them off and then I just painted them. And it's like um, a, called sure shot it looks like a game where you can shoot at the uh, guns and then there's a clown in the bottom and there are bingo chips surrounding that piece and and that kind of finishes it off well and the four um 
yellow guns are on a wheel and that wheel can freely turn. So there's there's a certain playfulness yet it's yet it's still a gun. It's, they're all guns. So the, it's kind of taken the bad omens that we all feel, especially now that we live in a gun shooting society, that uh, it took it takes away some of the fear. Um, Okay. And this one is up from Detritus. And I, once again, at the same place I found the childhood toys, I also found metal leaves. And I had a whole bag of these metal leaves on this very 1950s um, mannequin. And she's, she's got a bird in her, in her mouth. And the the leaves that surround her, um, it feels like because it's surrounding her form, she's busting up through um, a detritus of of um, a detritus of of um, leaves. You know, old. Um, I I don't know what I had lost the word, but old. All the uh, old uh, lost um, corroded leaves that would be in a pile on the on the street, and she's coming up through that, and uh, it, it 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 just fits, and it fits in a in a kind of humorous humorous way, um, and it's and again it softens the the blow of of a, a poignant um, piece. This one here is one of the first explorations I was exploring, uh, making, um, pr using printers blocks and uh, some meters and some, the, there's a, uh, a deer in that and a, a hand coming out. There's a kind of a surreal quality while there's this bishop in the corner um, and, a, and a fan. So there's, there's silver on both sides of it and they, together they amass a, a, a feeling. The longer you sit and stare at it, you can come up with um, lots of memories of uh, when you were a kid and you saw those, those pieces um, in someone's yard or what have you. And this one is called Handmade. Um, and it's, it's a head, um, and using again, my meters, using it as the eyes, creating a whole head from the, um, uh, from the hat, hat, um, it's a hat mold. And this has uh, hooks on it. And we've, I've made them into, um, earrings, um, and then there's a hat hand with a, uh, a mirror on it that will give you a, a glimpse of, of yourself in it. And this, um, yeah, there we go. And it's, it's on two different um, levels of, of uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, of, of, of sta standing. On, on two different levels, and then it's freestanding on the podium. Uh, and this one is using a lot of clocks. Uh, I often use uh, time is a continuum that I use in my work a lot. Uh, the gears from clocks or just plain gears. I call this one dentium because if you look close at the um, prints, those, those printers blocks, you can see they're, they're from, I guess it's a dental catalog or a medical journal that, that has all of these teeth on it. And I just thought it was a, a, a wonderful, it brought me back to days when I was at the dentist and I felt like those, and I felt like those mouths open up 
exposed and 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 painful. <laughs> so and and here's an uh, this is what the first one I did with um, with um, printers, gadgets, and mounds and clocks. Um, and as you can see, the one the little woman with the full it's like a 50s cartoon, and a lot of them are 50s cartoons. Um, so when you look at the piece, you can say, gee, it's, you're looking all over that, but there's something, there's something in your past that may spark a memory with some of these images. images. And that's my point. Stay and linger and look. There's even a bottle cap from Peel's Beer. I don't know if you know Peel's Beer, but it was uh, my father. Uh, my father used to drink it back in the fifties and sixties. So, thank you, and that's, Kathleen. That's my show. Yeah. Okay. Looks great. And now we're moving uh, into Susan Leshnoff's exhibition. Hello, Susan. Is she there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm a, a person who really uh, focuses upon nature. And I uh, work from uh, personal experiences uh, photographs, but always based upon personal experiences first. What I do is I start usually with the photograph and then go off because what I'm seeing is three-dimensional and what I'm working on is always flat. It's two-dimensional. And as an artist, you always have that tension if you're a painter between the three-dimensional world and translating it into uh, a flat, onto a flat canvas or a panel. This particular painting is of clouds. I've been a cloud watcher since I was a little girl. I think it's because the clouds were more interesting than anything else in the suburbs, uh, suburb of New Jersey where I grew up. And um, I'd never gotten over it. And the clouds um, are a gateway to a spiritual realm and me and the spirit are very very close and what I hope through my art is that those people who are looking at my art can identify with the kind of feeling that I have I would hope or a another feeling that is unique to themselves which my paintings can evoke and uh, if you look over to the right and you see that watercolor of um, mountains, at the very top of the mountains is a lighted area. I call that particular watercolor radiance because uh, the mountains, I mean, this goes back to um, biblical thinking, the mountains as you climb up are going to get you to a point that will be closest to the spiritual realm or the religious realm. And I think that that is part of what I was trying to express. Also in that particular painting and then the one below, there's a strong sense of line, a strong sense of what I call a calligraphic line or calligraphy line because it's meant to be free. And uh, the way that I work has a lot to do with not only color and shape, but also of, of the evocation of particular uh, emotional responses that I have to nature uh, working through line. Uh, specifically, uh, some particular paintings have to do with uh, specific geographic areas. The one that you're looking at right now is um, a, a feeling of the Southwest, that vast expanse of, of space, that gloriously wonderful sky, the low mountains, the sense of the desert, uh, the sense of all that scrub brush uh, and uh, greenery, which uh, does seem to be hidden, but is really there. 
in uh, the, the landscape. And uh, my way of thinking about nature has to do with the first impressions, or the lasting impression, I should say, the strongest impression that I could say um, about how I am responding to what I'm seeing. And even if I try and work the painting, trying to uh, go in another direction, it's the funniest, craziest thing, because I will eventually go right back to that immediate feeling for actually painting that particular um, visual thought. Uh, the painting that you're looking at right now, uh, which is uh, one of the larger ones, is called Precipice and Light. And it's that feeling that one has when you're outside and it's dark, and you see that by one way or another, there is some light that is illuminating particular areas and it's almost breathtaking. And so in this particular painting, again, all of these are based upon personal experiences of being outside in nature or, or being in a car and looking at nature. Uh, and uh, this one has that experience, which I remember so vividly of uh, darkness with some illumination uh, that um, creates, helps one uh, understand that even what you're looking at has a type of physical sense which can be uh, translated into a painting through the use of a color and shape and line. Uh, over to the left, uh, if you pan over to the left, there's a little painting. Uh, and I, uh, I think I, I call that a Southwest landscape, I believe. And um, it was, it's based upon my experience of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And I think that uh, the kind of light that is illuminating on the painting right now distorts a little bit of the sense of the great uh, versatility of the reds. And what I did was I put a lot of ideas together. I put together the ideas of, um, of mountains the idea of the sky, the idea of, of that incredible space of, um, of the Grand Canyon, and, um, and combined it in such a way with such colors that it would evoke a sense of, um, of memory of, um, in a very abstract way of, um, of that, particular, um, immense, the, that particular immensity that one experiences when, we're, when you're in the Southwest, and particularly at the Grand Canyon. And the colors themselves have so much to do with the colors of uh, that particular uh, area of uh, the United States. So um, this one is a little one. And again, it has to do, it, it obviously has to do with some type of coming storm over uh, the water. And um, I, it's a funny feeling right now, working with storms and, and water and flood because of all the hardships that people have been under. But this is really something which artists have had to grapple with for a very, very long time, really going back to the 18th century and the a feeling of the sublime, that there is this awesomeness and there's this terribleness in a sense of, of, of aspects of nature and yet how beautiful at all it can be. It becomes an aesthetic problem, you know, um, Turner um, doing, um, you know, the, the, the parliaments uh, uh, burning and uh, doing, you know, um, types of, of um, rough waters. And yet um, there is something beautiful about it, but how, in a sense, do you, do you uh, rationalize that uh, as making a painting um, in which some people could be suffering? I'm choosing not to think about that, but rather um, thinking about it in a more innocent way, that there is something beautiful about coming storms. Uh, the paintings that are here on this particular wall have to do with uh, um, landscape, um, particular places of landscape and then some uh, sensory experiences of trees. Over to the left is uh, a a painting uh, that is based upon the wetlands that uh, I last experienced um, in the John Hines um, a wetlands that are very close to the Philadelphia airport. Of course, it's my take on it. And if you look at it closely, you'll see 
there is that those calligraphic lines which seem to be so much a part of me which have been coming out more and more as I um, mature as an artist and let's hope that we continue to mature all the time on, until there's no more of us and what I'm doing here is really creating a sense of uh, in which the viewer can meander from uh, the cattails in the front all the way going toward the back in a, 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 a type of maze-like way and hope, hoping that the end result would be something that would be meditative. It's not the same as the Book of Kells or the type of mazes that, uh, the, um, the, uh, that were done in the monasteries uh, during the uh, Middle Ages, but in a way there is that same sense that I'm trying to evoke that if you follow that waterway all the way around and you um, move your mind and your eyes until you get to the very back of the horizon, that there should be hopefully some kind of transformation in the way that you feel uh, and that you should be reaching a sense of, of uh, peace and a sense of um, maybe um, a meditative state. I'm not sure about that and how, if that's, possible for everybody, but um, when I look at this painting, it um, does help me get to another place in uh, this world, my reality. And then um, the a painting on the top is just of trees, and uh, there are a couple of paintings that are just of trees, and I have to say that this is based upon that overwhelming feeling that I have when I look at um, a forest or I look at a grove of trees, it's too much for the eyes to really behold and too much for the mind to really comprehend. And that there's this feeling of, of engagement with something, with something that is just so complex. And that's the reason why I've chosen to uh, focus upon uh, the branches and uh, the uh, long chunks of those particular trees. That's different than the one below, in which, which I think about it called something about light and shadow. That in this grove of trees, there's this great sense of shadow, but there's also a sense of light. And uh, both of them, the, the one above was a mixed media. This one is watercolor, and it's done in a very fresh style. Although I have to say uh, that it, uh, its completion was, was uh, definitely done in stages. There's barely anything that I do that just is done quickly, but rather something which I think about and then apply another layer to, uh, to get to the point of where I can say, ah, I'm finished, which is hard for artists to do. The next painting, I guess, uh, is um, related to that idea of the uh, sublime, which I was talking about, or the, um, the brewing storm uh, here, that's everything is vibrating. Everything is vibrating. The clouds are vibrating. The land is calling out to you. And all of the greenery, everything is alive. And uh, that's meant to, uh, to help um, evoke exactly that type of um, response. Certainly, that was my response when I was making it, that um, there is a type of vibrancy that does, uh, does develop using the types of uh, colors that I have included, as well as the, the variety of brush strokes and the sizes of the brush strokes and the gestures that you see, for instance, in the way that the, um, the sky is done as um, you see it being panned right now from uh, right to left. And the overall impression is one of vibrancy again. And that vibrancy, the land so often comes alive during uh, uh, certain types of atmospheric condi conditions. And I have to say that atmosphere is one of the things which I try to evoke and try to capture. And that's one of the reasons why I paint, because um, the nature that we see is always bleeding. It's always changing. What we see is so based upon the moment and then it's gone, especially when it has to do with light. And, um, and uh, that's the, uh, the basis of that particular painting. So I think that there are a few more. Yes. And that big one that you see in the middle. 
is also based upon wetlands, but I call it serenity because unlike the other one, there is so little in this particular painting which can upset that sense of serenity that you feel. You see the uh, vegetation over to the right uh, and then also down in the uh, lower, uh, to the left and to uh, in the lower right hand corner. And again, so much of that is based upon this new need that I have to be calligraphic when I'm painting and to add these types of lines that have a type of energy that I hope transmi uh, it, uh, transmits this feeling of energy that is always part of the organic nature. And so um, as you go higher up into the painting, you see that there is this sense of serenity. You see the reflection of the clouds in the water and the, uh, the greens that have been used are greens that are meant to calm one, but also to make you understand that the greens that you see are so much affected by the sky and uh, the uh, sunlight that upon which uh, this composition has to be based. There's a little painting here. Again, it's a watercolor. I think I call it blue and green because that's what I've developed. Again, it's calligraphic and um, there's a certain kind of joy that I, I find in um, making a composition work. Uh, in other words, here we have just a simple um, a simple composition of a, a hill or a low mountain with some uh, greenery trees in the front and some water in between. And yet those lines that I have, which help define what you're actually seeing, help make the, uh, the scene come alive. And I have to say that um, uh, my husband is the reason why I have thousands and thousands of photographs before we worked with digital cameras because I could not ever control myself from all of the uh, car rides that we've taken uh, from, um, from taking uh, pictures and pictures and pictures because so much of what I paint is uh, based upon the type of nature which is unexplored, the type of nature that one sees as we're, you're going by the roadside, the uh, type of nature that people, that the, um, any type of tour is not going to stop and tell you, hey, look at this. But the truth of the matter is it's so beautiful. And I try to, um, to encompass that in my artwork and help people realize that you don't have to go very far away. You don't have to go around the globe in order to find beauty. It's right there at your doorstep. This little one here is, um, is a little different because it's based upon spring and the first blossoms that are coming out. And again, there are the calligraphic lines and the splotches of color and uh, that, that uh, a beautiful sense of, of green and yellow, the kind of greenish yellow that you see when a spring is just starting to burst. That's small, I think it's about nine by 12. And then uh, three more paintings. Um, the one over to the left is the experience of going up a hill. Again, I think that it has some type of spiritual basis because you're going up the hill and you want to get to the top and there's something about going up a hill and reaching the top and feeling that you have not only accomplished that, but there is a type of spiritual realm that's connected with it. And again, you see the freedom of the lines that um, are so important to me and the style that I'm developing. This is a watercolor and it's called Spring. And again, it, this one is, is based again um, on, uh, in, in the area really of Colorado. And um, just this feeling of, of the, 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 the burst of leaves, um, the burst of the trees as they, um, as they mature in the season um, against a hilltop, against the sky, something that helps you feel good because you know that spring leads to summer, to fall, to winter, and here you've got a permanent memory. And then last, but maybe, I hope not least, is um, one of my experiences of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania cornfields, and it's an homage to 
all of the trips that I have taken over the many years of driving through Pennsylvania, especially in the summer when you see the corn stalks, you see the low-lying hills, and um, there's a, a kind of beauty that, again, is ephemeral. It's not going to last that long. Soon the corn stalks are going to turn yellow and then almost white, and the corn's going to be picked, and the hills will no longer be green. But there is a sense here, perhaps this one is a little bit more representational than the other ones. And um, I do have to say that my artwork goes from something which seems more based upon a representational viewpoint and less based upon abstraction which, uh, and getting to the essence, which uh, you saw in some of my other artworks. So I think that I've covered everything that is in the show, and um, that's my speech. Thank you, Susan. Now we're entering uh, Caroline Furr's exhibition. Caroline? Yes, I'm here. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and your yes, work? yes. I've been I've been um, I've been working for about 45 years now. My education is in sculpture, and I made sculpture for a number of years after I got out of school. But sculpture is a limited language. I don't I I shouldn't say that, but it is it it can't say everything. Painting can say everything. So I started painting. This is called Industrial Revolution or Evolution. Did you, did we call it evolution this time? Or whatever. This is a oil on canvas that's mounted on wood. So I stopped making sculpture and I started painting. And I painted for about another 20 years on oil on canvas. This is oil on canvas on mounted on board. And this is called Science Led Astray. It helps when you look at my work, if you think of surrealism, every piece is different. I don't, I've never painted the same thing twice. I don't have massive themes I'm trying to impart. Um, what, but the constant thing in my work is that I don't do anything twice and I work with a variety of materials. These are all framed by myself and we know what a clunky job framing is when an artist get, gets their hands on it. But that's part of the reason for these paintings. The paintings float in an ambiguous time and space. This is called the golden mean. The golden mean is, appears in math and, and philosophy. Obviously, this is the part that's the math. This isn't accurate. You can't trust anything in a painting. That bone across is a piece of canvas that's been applied. So all of these are pretty mixed media. The cutout, any cutouts that I use come from old paintings. This is a painting I did when my mother died. I think, she, I, think I called the painting that she was in, Exit. What do we have here? A spider beside her. And you can see a woman lying there in the maze, up oh, an upside down head. <laughs> and there, in what could be considered her personal areas, resides a spider. Most of my work has a, I hope, humorously dark undertone. This is SOS, and that's um, a person on top of this rock. I, I don't know, it's pretty clear, I guess. He looks in trouble, and those other, the dog, the uh, camel, and that other person are walking away. 
And the SOS comes from another painting of a garden outside of Paris, where this is in um, the hedge. <laughs> For years, I painted um, hedges. I was interested in nature as people tried to tame it and do something to it. This piece is called A Self-Supporting Structure and could be considered a very phallic piece. I encourage you to think that way. these strange frames. You can't go to Blick and get these kinds of frames. Where do you get them? You have to, you have to scrounge around. Most of these frames came back uh, from Barcelona and um, they're, this is called Tell Me. I like to paint Tell Me. I've painted Tell Me a couple of times and it's always these two make-believe people. The other painting has a blue eye that's looking this way at, to the viewer. So it encourages the viewer to think that maybe they're involved in telling or being told. Ah, circles. There's the smudge pot that you can barely see, the orange, the breast, and the smile face. It's simply called circles. The smile face and the lady and the gloved hand are from another painting. This is a painting of a cat and it's called Cosmos. And it's how I feel cats really do see us. It's not the most loving look in the world. I don't want to say too much about paintings because People see what they want to see. And sometimes what they see is probably much more interesting than what I think they should see. This is called Select. There's a man on the right, and then underneath the vase is another man's shadow. Fruit, a vase. A simple, innocent picture. <laughs> so there they are. They're all together. Oh, Tina is coming outside to see. Everything is real. This lady, the face, the round face, appears in another painting of mine with a cat called Admiration, where the cat is offering adoring looks at this person. She's looking away though. And that ear is actually a rock. But that's the only thing that I didn't make myself. Oh, the frame, another ticky tacky frame from Barcelona. <laughs> you lived there, right? Yes, twice, we were there twice. We didn't have enough the first time, we had to go back. It's fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Michael and Tina. Now we're heading to uh, Gus Sermis's exhibition, but unfortunately Gus can't be with us this evening. So while Tina goes through his exhibit, I'll read his uh, artist statement for you. So Gus lives in Wilmington, but he's originally from Greece. And he was a professor of art and art history at Westchester University for many years. So here's his statement. 
<clears throat> As a Greek American born near Sparta, classical Greek mythology has always fascinated me. Throughout my career, I have relied on those iconic stories to engage the issues that face contemporary society and us as individuals. The story of Persephone, for example, deals broadly with themes of death and renewal, but it can also be seen as an environmental fable that illustrates the fragility of the natural order. These myths, which I learned from early childhood, inspire my art but I don't literally illustrate them. Instead, they have a great a general influence on the choices I make in color, shape, and composition. And although I don't render the visual appearance of things, my work often evokes a dialogue between the man-made and organic natural form. <clears throat> my mode of working is largely improvisational. I often start with a thematic idea and with that in mind, establish a simple formal outline. But from there, I make numerous additions with many major and minor adjustments. I reserve the right to change any aspect of the painting at any time. <laughs> it's important to me that while working toward refinement, I preserve the visual evidence of spontaneity. Painting for me is the accumulation of small but critical gestures that add up to, it, to an embodiment of my thoughts, values, prejudices, and preferences. In short, it is the self made visible. Paintings are multi-leveled artifacts, vessels of meaning that fuse form, subject, and content. Okay, so that is our uh, walkthrough of all the exhibits. Are there questions for any of the artists from anybody? Artists, do you have questions for each other? You can um, put in the chat or just, uh, you can state it if you like. Anybody? Well, all right, then if there aren't any questions, we'll end the Zoom here. I'd like to thank all the artists for all their fine work. It's a beautiful collection. We're honored to be showing your work. And I'd also like to thank everybody for coming. Um, the show is up, like I said, through October 10th. You can come and visit and you can see everything on the website. I put a link to the website in the chat and uh, have a good night everyone thank you michael <laughs> thank you very much and I mean, I know so. yeah i i just want to say i'm in such good such fine company of other artists i am in awe of all your work thank you Kathy. You that's me? very nice mm -hmm. oh oh thank you I owe yes. calls to everyone. I'm calling everyone tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
yes, thank you. <laughs> I just want to put in an extra thank you to uh, Tina because I can't believe how wonderfully she um, she organizes each artist's art um, exhibit. She's really quite a genius. Spatial oh, genius. well, thank you, Susan. That's very <laughs> I agree. It's, it's easy when it's good work. So you, you make my job a lot easier. It's all beautiful. I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a, I had a question um, of someone's work you, that reminded me of something and it flew out of my head. I had a major senior moment. I should have written it down, but all of the is interesting and where you you it came to from your core and it was just it was just very interesting to hear about everybody's work thank you thanks everyone for tuning in bye okay, okay thank you bye 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 Alina J bye Caroline Bye, sweetheart. We'll see you on the street with Mr. Finley. Right. <laughs> I, I had him. I had him muted on purpose. Oh, you did. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> You've contributed a lot. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Bye, Louis. Bye, Bye. Jude. Bye. See you soon. Bye, sweetie. Bye, friend.